Happy International Women's Day. Now let's talk about dudes. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it Good morning Run and it welcome back. to Run It Back. Yeah, yeah. It is Wednesday morning, which is our Friday morning. I say that every week just to confuse anybody who's figuring this out. But I'd like to introduce the panel today. Stadium Insider, Sham Sharania, Chandler P with the... I mean, you went from the worst background to the best background, and that's impressive, my friend. And Eddie G coming to us from... Arizona, undisclosed. Ah, yes, <laughs> undisclosed location in Arizona. All right, good. You're on the West. You're kind of on the West Coast-ish, which is where we are going to start, unfortunately. Uh, the Lakers. Yep, they're making me look stupid. Uh, beat the Grizzlies 112-103 <laughs> last night. AD had 30 and 22 with two blocks. They are now 7-3 and three in their last 10 games, sitting in the nine spot. Chandler, talk to me. Give me some good news. Is this going to keep going this way for the Lakers? <laughs> I mean, listen, they're seven and three in their last 10. Uh, and this is the highest spot they've been in the standings since starting off this season two and 10, when we're all kind of crushing them all season long, all the ups and downs. They're finally playing good and they're playing like a, like a real team. They're having a balanced attack. Their role players, um, you know, are contributing. And this is the version that we talked about for those couple of weeks before Anthony Davis got hurt, where he's dominating the game. He's getting to the foul line. He's dominating the defensive end. He's scoring, he's rebounding, he's blocking shots. He's being that franchise all NBA player right now while LeBron's out, while D'Lo's out. Uh, and this this was exciting. This was I watched this game at this dinner party last night with a bunch of Laker people, and they are into it. They are, they are, they are rallying behind this team. There's obviously no reason for this team to lose. We know the tanking isn't there. And the crowd was into it. They went on this huge run in the fourth quarter. And that's the loudest I've ever seen in that arena in a really long time. Um, it, it's fun. And look, hopefully they can sustain it. Cause again, it's, it's the, the, the it, everyone either loves or hates the Lakers. Right. And, and, and it's fun when they're playing like this and they're very dangerous. And we always talk about the moves they made at the deadline and they got a lot better. And so credit to them on that and credit to Anthony Davis going on this heater he's on right now. Cause the, for them to keep succeeding, he's gotta be this guy, especially with Braun out. Yeah, I mean, it's all about AD's health at this point. 34 points a game, almost 14 rebounds a night. He's averaging three blocks a night since LeBron James has been out. So when you think about these last four games, they've needed him to step up. He's done exactly that. They've gotten some good performances. Austin Reeves has really stepped up. Uh, different guys are, are playing at high levels. And D'Angelo Russell, the expectation is he's going to be back on Friday. I think there was some hope that he'd be back last night. Uh, they survived without him. So look for D'Angelo Russell to be back in the lineup for the Lakers on Friday. And then you're really going to get a chance to see this team. LeBron James still going to be out for the foreseeable future, at least the next couple weeks. And then, you know, even I think beyond that is what the Lakers expect. So uh, he's still walking around in a boot. We've, we've seen him on, in videos on a scooter. We've seen him walk around in a boot. So uh, we'll see once that boot is off and, and how he's able to manage that injury. Man, I can't wait for all the talking heads to say, are the Lakers better without LeBron James? What a fun day in sports. Uh, Eddie, role players. He, Shams mentioned a few there. Which ones impressed you the most so far in this run? Well, it, it's a funny question. It is, well, maybe they are better than uh, without Russell Westbrook. But, I mean, if you look at the role players, you got to <laughs> start with Austin Reeves, right? You got to start with all of his uh, heroics late in the game and, and just – as a player who now can handle the ball, can set up the offense, it can hit big shots and cross dudes over like this. Uh, you you got to say him, but at the end of the day, they're all stepping up. Rui Hachimura had a big game last night. They're stepping up by committee without LeBron. And now you you do kind of wonder, like, how does this team look with LeBron? How does it? How does Anthony Davis look with LeBron dominating the ball? And, and where did he slot in? And look, I, I don't think any team is better without LeBron but they're different for sure. And then D'Lo will bring some of that when he comes back running pick and roll with AD, but look, they're hitting big shots and seven. And, you know, I was captain Russ all year. I thought he was doing great. He was doing the best he could with a bad situation, but maybe they're better without Russ. Maybe they are. Sorry. Uh, yeah, listen, <laughs> they're, they're definitely better without Russ. It's not even close the, the idea of them being better on <laughs> I don't love that. I think he does need to find a fine balance and a fine role to allow AD to keep dominating a game like this. Like when he comes back, AD needs to be the first option. LeBron needs to facilitate, do everything, take over games when he needs to, but 
This needs to be Anthony Davis's team this year and moving forward. Uh, yeah, the role players have been great. Austin Reeves, that little bang bang crossover was nasty last night. He's been so good offensively. To me, it's Jared Vanderbilt. Ever since they've got this kid, he's this long athletic wing that they can plug in and he does all the little things. He's getting them extra possessions. He locks up defensively. He's a, he was, it was a nightmare for Luca. Uh, a couple nights ago, he, he can score the ball. He finishes. Uh, so adding guys like that, it's great for just the, the chemistry of the team and the, the guys that necessarily don't show up on the stat sheet that can work hard, play hard, that have a huge role in this team. So Jared Vanderbilt to me has been the, the biggest addition to them, honestly, just the way he impact wins. Uh, I, I know that Lakers fans are notoriously late, right? But I started that game last night and because they had all the yellow Pau Gasol jerseys, it looked so empty for so long. It made me nervous, but they showed up. It was a special moment retiring his number 16 right next to Kobe's. It was very emotional Chandler. What'd you think about the ceremony? It was beautiful. It was really beautiful with Kobe's family there right next to him. Uh, we all know how close they were the championship runs and, Listen, Pal deserves this. He's a gay, he's a Laker great. He's an NBA great. He's one of the best European players of all time. So this was, uh, yeah, I got a little emotional even myself just watching this, just <laughs> everything that's went into this and, and the kind of that their pairing and then their relationship was was truly special. Um, and so it was really cool to see them now in the Raptors uh, forever. <laughs> that shot right there. <laughs> Eduardo, are you there? I am. I mean, it, it was it was tough to see, and obviously, it tugs at your heartstrings when Kobe comes up, when Vanessa says what she has to say, and just as Kobe said, his number was right next to his uh, child, Krantz, the child chance Kobe. Like <laughs> it was, it was a lot, but it's it's dope to see for Powell. He's it's well deserved. He was one of the greatest Lakers of all time, and, and now he has his number in the Raptors to signify that. So, um, you know, I don't know if this is the closing of kind of that era of their team, but uh, it was an emotional night for everybody involved and and, and well-deserved. It was, it was awesome. It was it was a good moment. I, I love that night. Um, but got to talk a little bit of Grizzlies. They are now on a three-game losing streak. Um, look, they got Warriors, Mavs, at Mavs, Heat, and Spurs coming up next. But the big question is going to be, and it's going to remain, what's going to happen with Josh Oms? Anything on the latest with that? Yeah, so right now there are two investigations ongoing. You have one, the NBA's investigation. You have the Colorado police investigation. So, so far it's been two games out for John Morant. Um, there's no timetable on his return. Taylor Jenkins has said it uh, multiple times. And, and from the sense that I gather, the expectation within the team is that this could be an extended absence, something that could be, be for the foreseeable future. And more stringent penalties could come from the league, could come from the police. And right now, from what I've been told, Morant has been behind the scenes accepting accountability. He's receiving help. It's unclear exactly what that help is. So we'll see how forthright the Grizzlies slash Morant will be in the coming days and weeks. But the Grizzlies are going to support him. It's, it's been a balance of support and also trying to hold this guy, uh, you know, the guy that's the face of your franchise, the guy that means so much to all these players. You've seen players come out and say he's their brother. They have a lot of respect for him. They, they want to see the best in him. Um, not really faulting him, really, just really supporting him. There's a balance there between support and accountability, and I think there's, they're trying to figure out exactly how they can do it. Look, the, the team's fighting. I mean, they're in these games, and then they're just not Chandler. But the, uh, the truth is we had no idea when John Morant's coming back, if he's coming back even during the regular season at all. So how does this team tread water the rest of the way without him? They're not a contender without John Moran. John Moran is too important to this team. He's too explosive. He's too valuable to everything they do. And it, it, Tyus Jones, a lot of this falls on him. He's got to be that solid backup player that's now being the head of the snake. Uh, and you can't have Dylan Brooks going five for 17 and Desmond Bain going three for 17 if they want to be in these games. Those guys are kind of high volume scorers that have to find ways to get better shots. They have to get to the free throw line more. Uh, and they have to be able to be taking better shots at the end of the day and Jaron Jackson Jr. is their best player now moving forward he's got to be able to do everything and be the catalyst on the defensive end but this is a tough blow and it's not gonna it's he's not gonna be back anytime soon this is too severe this is too serious of a situation um, and I wouldn't be surprised if they lost home court advantage and they took a huge drop here looking at the schedule <laughs> none of those are gimmies Golden State Dallas Dallas Miami and San Antonio the Spurs might even beat him without John Grant Michelle 
Thank you. Thank you so much for throwing that in there. <laughs> Shams. Yeah. You know, yeah, I think it's interesting because last year they went 20 and four, I think, or 20 and five without John Moran. This year they're four and seven without him. And I think there's, you, you can just tell there's a noticeable difference with this team this year on the road. They have a worse road record for sure. And that's something that we discussed this week as well with, with the Steven Adams comments in the players only meeting. There's, there's been something, yes, they've been dominant at home, but there's clearly been something off on the road. And even without John Morant, they've struggled in the lineup. And so, uh, to me, culturally, it's a hit for them. It's something that's going to be a distraction for, for at least a little bit as much as I, I think they want to, you know, get, get over it. I mean, I'm curious from Chandler's perspective, like if you were playing in that locker room, how would you feel? Would this be a distraction for you or would this be something that you try to get over? Like, how do you how do you even deal with this? I mean, it's a full distraction for sure. But at the same time, like I said, guys like Tyus Jones are now getting that opportunity to show the Grizzlies, other teams that I'm a starting point guard. This now gives Desmond Bain and Dylan Brooks just more opportunity. So as much as it sucks, and, and I think they know, wow, we're not, they, they know they're not a contender without John Moran. He's important to that team. It's kind of like the New Orleans with Zion. Like when the, there's, there's some teams that have to be fully loaded to be a contender. This is one of them. And their margin for error now is very, very small without him. And when you look at their roster, they don't have the most talented roster. So they, they're based off toughness. They're based off defense, playing hard. And they're still going to win some games. But it, it's just it's night and day. And the locker room, yeah, as much as you are pissed off and frustrated that he's kind of let you down and, you know, he could technically ruin this entire season for them. It's also giving t guys and, and other players more opportunity to kind of take that step in their career. So it's 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 kind of 50 50, but most of these guys would rather have their guy and compete for a championship than, you know, average a couple more points because he's out. Yeah, I mean, last night is a good example of what Desmond Bain's limitations are. He was scoreless until the fourth quarter. He needs help creating those shots. He's not a great ball handler. He's not going to initiate your offense. Tyus Jones is a great backup point guard. He's not necessarily your Ja Morant replacement. So you need that dynamic offensive player to create offense for the other bucket on his, on his own when need be. Sounds basketball is that simple. Your guy is really good. My guy is really good. Let's see what they both this game. And, and, you know, this is a great example of them needing him late in that game to, to keep up with everything that the Lakers were in the playoffs. So yes, they need to get through this. They need to figure out what the ramifications are of Jaws situation and whether there are legal ramifications or what, what have you. But if they want to actually contend, if they want to actually be the two seed, well, the three seed now th they need him. And, and so all of the great numbers about when they don't have him and their record without him and all that cool stuff, they need him either. What, no matter how you look at it, they need John Morant back ASAP. It's so psychologically different. I mean, an injury is nobody's fault. This is all his fault. I, I imagine there's a lot of <laughs> anger uh, that's not going away anytime soon. So um, in obvious news, the Thunder beat the Warriors last night. What is the deal? But, but you know what? In fairness, we're not even going to start with the Warriors. We need to <laughs> deal with that in a second. But how about the Oklahoma City Thunder? Their future seems so bright. SGA with 33. Josh Giddy with his seventh triple-double of the year. Chandler, look, it. There's no expectations, right, for this season. But do they have any shot of doing anything with what's left? I mean, yeah, they could sneak in. And listen, anything is a positive when you look at a team like this. <laughs> uh, it, it's they To me, they have the brightest future in all of the NBA. When you look at SGA, he's an absolute star. And you look at the amount of youth and these players on their team that haven't even scratched the surface of how good they can be, they are in a great position. I mean, I do think making that that play in and having some valuable uh, you know playoff experience would be very beneficial to these guys, but that's not even about that. And can you, they have no vets. Can you imagine this young team with like adding on like two or three vets in the locker room and on the court to kind of show these kids the ropes and what to do and kind of be there and, and, and crunch time of tough games. This, these guys are playing hard and Josh Giddy's unbelievable. He's one of the smartest point guards in the league. He said last night, I didn't do much. The guys just made shots, but he, he makes the right play. He doesn't force anything. Uh, he's tall. He's long. He makes the simple pass. Uh, and, and he's a really good point guard. He's going to be really good for, for a really long time. But it's it's this team is special. They have Chet there sitting on the shelf who they can only get better with. They're going to have another pick. Uh, the future is very, very bright for these guys. And, and I love everything they're doing. So get to the play-in. Get, don't get to the play-in. Either way, this has been a very successful season for them.
Yeah, it, it feels like things are going to be getting exciting here pretty quickly, Shams. And he mentioned Chet, Chet Holmgren, of course, who's missed the entire season. Let's talk about how bright this team's future is when he gets back and with whatever else happens. Yeah, I mean, that's their version of Victor Wembanyama. They they went out and got him last year. He's the he's the he's he's their version of the unicorn. And I think uh, there's high expectations for Chet Holmgren once he's back in the lineup. I think this year, the, the Thunder being able to be in a position where they can contend for a playoff berth, contend for a play, and I think that's probably a little further along than expected. But Shea Gildas-Alexander, uh, he's gone through this process, but I think you, you can tell he wants to be a part of a team that wins. And Josh Giddy and him, I, I'm curious to see how they continue to coexist, how they continue to play together. Because you, you look at them play, they both sometimes need the ball in their hands, but they also do other things and, and slash. And, and Josh Giddy's becoming a much better three point shooter. Josh Giddy, one of four 20 year olds in NBA history, averaged, averaged 16 points, seven rebounds, six assists, joining Magic Johnson, LeBron, and Luka. So clearly, this Dang. guy can play, he can pass, he can facilitate. <laughs> Um, and just how him and Shea continue to you know, get a relationship on the court, off the court, that's going to be the biggest key, I think, to the Thunder future. Eddie, you there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's an insane that's list of names to be. I know. Yeah, He's that's an insane all of list of names. I mean, look, three Hall of Famers and, and Josh Giddy. I, I, I think what's always important to note, too, with Shea Gilders Alexander, he can't rent a car until July. He won't even be 24, <laughs> 25 until this summer. So if you're talking about a youth revival and ushering more uh, youth into that team, they have that. And, and he's had some playoff experience as well. Him and Lou Dort kind of went to war with James Harden in seven game series in the bubble, for which I know Shams remembers he was out there. Um, they don't necessarily need the playoffs this season. They're battle tested in a sense and they're scrappy. So it's an exciting time out there for them. And, and next year really like look at them to make the leap, not only with bringing in Chet, but whoever else they add. And they have a ton of flexibility with all their draft picks with a ton of cap space. If anybody's going to add a star and everybody's capable to add a and, you know, they might make that leap top four seed next year and be a true contender. They have all the tools right now. All of those years of tanking will finally show what it was all for. It's kind of, it's kind of exciting. I know people don't want to hear that, but it is. Uh, on the other side, though, the Warriors, man, those chemistry issues. Uh, it's like they never, ever went away. Draymond and Jordan Poole, uh, he gets frustrated with him. Just... <laughs> basically gives up on the play that's just that's not a good moment Chandler look uh, the reaction from Draymond and how do you fix it like what, what are your thoughts on that because it just seems like at this point in the season this should not still be happening yeah I mean this is this is a ridiculous reaction in the middle of a game and a close yeah. game oh, he's not even that open and even if he catches the ball here I don't necessarily know what he would even do with the ball in this situation uh but this is this is just a chemistry killer this is a this is bad for for morale this is bad for you know Steve Kerr's going to show this on film today and Draymond Green is going to be very embarrassed by this reaction and it's a small play in a big game, uh, but that just speaks volumes of kind of where he is, where him and Jordan Poole was. It seems like a lot of these guys get more frustrated when Jordan Poole does something than when other guys, because I'm sure Steph, I'm sure Clay, I'm sure Wiggins have missed Draymond way worse than this situation, but I don't remember seeing him react like this. So uh, this is to this to do this in the second quarter of a, of a one point game as well. This is clearly leading up. This is building. And the Warriors didn't look good last night. They got 40 points in the first quarter. Um, and they, they, they're a good defensive team. They have all the tools to be a good defensive team, but you can tell there's something going on here. And maybe this is a spiral effect from the events this summer, but this happened earlier in the season where Steph threw his mouthpiece because he got pissed off at Jordan Poole for, you know, missing him and taking a bad shot. And I don't see this happening with other guys. So maybe this is a Jordan Poole issue. Um, but again, he's also super valuable to this team and the success they have this year because they need him to be aggressive. They need him to be, especially now coming off the bench, they need him to go and get 30. Uh, so it's it's a tricky situation. But there definitely seems like there's some frustration with him. <laughs> it's it's tough. And, and I'm with Chandler. Draymond's not nearly as open as he thought he was. I don't I, like <laughs> Josh Giddy's right there. He's probably still in that ball. Whatever they have with Jordan Poole, that's a lot of money to pay him. And then it, it Chandler knows the dynamics of the locker room. When somebody's making a lot of money, there's a lot to be asked for that person. Exactly. 
what everybody else is making on the team. So I wonder if the Warriors are looking at that contract or they look at it in a few years and go, did we make a mistake that summer? Did we do too much of that money that summer? Uh, was he deserving? I guess. I mean, he was up for his, his extension, but that's a lot for a sixth man, who, who a guy who night in, night out cannot carry that offense as they need him to. And, and clearly there's some chemistry issues. He's the young guy amongst the group of vets who've won a bunch of titles together and went to war together over and over and over. But I will say one thing, Chandler, Draymond Green is not going to be embarrassed when they run this back and say, <laughs> if anything, he's going to bite back and say, no, nah, he should have threw me the ball. Uh, but yeah, it's, I tweeted last night. I keep saying they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine, but maybe they just all hate each other and they're not going to be fine. <laughs> like maybe we're there with them right now. So I'm, I'm with we'll you. See. I'm with you, Eddie. I, I, I was, I've been saying that too. Like this, this will happen. This will click, but I'm just starting to think it's maybe not click. Look, there's a moment too last night, Jordan Poole. It just keeps piling on. Doesn't it? Uh, he gets a weird technical foul. I think it's weird. Maybe you guys don't think it's weird. We'll show it right here, but it's, he drops the bounce pass to the, the ref after getting called. <laughs> um, did he deserve it? Eddie, was that a little quick? I don't know, Petty. Oh, Chandler, you hear me? Uh, I mean, maybe he said something. It was a little bit aggressive, <laughs> and, and, and refs refs definitely don't like this because you could tell this was a reaction. And but this is kind of weak. I mean, he literally throws a bounce pass to the dude. Maybe it's a little low at the at the shins, but uh, I've seen some some tacky technicals. This is up there, man. This is you can't do this. It's not like he threw it at his face or his head. Oh my gosh, Trey Trey Young chiming in. It's the speed in the bounce pass, probably. He, he, he okay. checked him for a bad pass. Like uh, I guess it's and your guys are out of control. Man. On. Clearly, he's not trying to pass, and they're going to tee him up for a bad <laughs> bounce pass. It is, it's still not Scott Foster, Scotty Barnes, bad, but it's it's a weird moment for everyone. By the way, buried in all of this is the fact that Steph Curry had 40 points, 10 of, 10 of those coming from threes. It was only his second game back from injury. I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about this because it really wasn't even a focal point of this game when it was all said and done, Chandler. But what, what can we say or what can we take from the fact that Curry seems to be right back to normal? Well, this is huge. This is the only bright spot of the game is that they do have their guy back. He looks to be in playoff form. Um, but yeah, we're not going to talk about it a lot when they're losing to the Oklahoma City Thunder who are battling to even get in the play in. This is the most critical time of the year for teams and for teams that are contending. This is, every game is so important. You're now looking at seeds. You're now following other teams. And this is one of those games where you're going to look back and the Warriors are going to, you know, without home court advantage, if they don't get in there, you're going to be like, well, we, well, we lost to the Thunder by 10. And, and like, th th these are, these are bad losses, but there is a bright spot here with Steph Curry being back. Hopefully he misses no more time for the rest of the season and just kind of keeps building and building because they obviously need him mightily. Yeah, it seems to be an imperative. Uh, we're taking a quick break here. When we come back, Kyrie with 17 points in the fourth quarter. Dare I ask, are the Mavs figuring it out when Run It Back returns? Run it back, yeah. Run it up. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, 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 run it up, and run it back, yeah. Mavs with a win over the Jazz, 121-16 last night. Luka and Kyrie combined for 62. That's, you know, that's been the story. Irving with 17 in the fourth, like we mentioned. But here's the thing. It's taking a little bit longer than they probably wanted, Chandler. But are you seeing enough now to think, all right, this thing might work and it might work in time? Yeah, of course. And listen, this is going to take some time. It just happens to be getting traded late in the season where they don't really have that much time. So... We knew it wasn't going to click right away and, and you know, guys that are this ball dominant and are this offensive minded that have never played with each other. They didn't have a training camp. They probably have practiced still two, three times together. It's not just going to you know click and be there, but you see flashes of it. You can see Kyrie Irving is kind of taking over in, uh, in the fourth quarter of games and he's, he's, he's got that look at his eye in the fourth quarter and he's embracing this challenge and, and Luca is kind of also doing the same thing and they kind of are taking turns, letting each one rock. But at the end of the day, this was a, 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 against a struggling team who's really been struggling lately and then they barely squeaked one out here at home. So there's definitely still concerns. But how the games have been ending and the close and close losses, this this is a step forward. And 
it's not about these two. These two guys are going to figure it out. They're going to score a lot of points. It's the other guys. Tim Hardaway has been that third guy the last couple of games, but they need more. Josh Green is kind of that guy that they wanted to plug in Dor- uh, Dorian Finney-Smith's role. He's been struggling. Jalen Hardy doesn't even really play anymore. Their bigs aren't giving them a lot of value. Christian Woods coming off the bench again and playing 15 minutes a night. Uh, so there's a hole there in their depth. Um and one of those guys are going to have to step Reggie Bullock, Tim Hardaway, Josh Green. Some of these guys are going to have to, to step up here for this team to even have a chance because you know what you're going to get from Kyrie and Luca. Tim, they traded two starters away for one. So you lose a little depth there just by the nature of who you're playing, just by the nature of your rotation. So they need to figure out a fifth starter back in there. They need to figure out a, a consistent third contributor night in, night out. They don't have that extra ball handler and spend three and D guy. You knew exactly what Dorian Finney Smith was. And look, he hasn't been shooting lights out in Brooklyn either, but you knew exactly what he was and he was dependable. So they're figuring that out. Unfortunately for them, they have to do it in about three or four weeks to make some real, make some real noise in the playoffs, but you can see they're slowly working it out. And at the end of the day, you know exactly what you're getting from Kyrie. You know exactly what you're getting from Luca. They can play off each other. They can both give you 30, 40 points a night. It's just getting the other 40 points you need to win like they needed last night. Yeah, from all those role players that you guys mentioned. Look, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but I'm excited about the playoffs. If they started today, the Mavs would play the Suns in the first <laughs> round. Oh my God, Eddie, how exciting would this be? Crazy exciting. And it'd be <laughs> a nice, easy flight. Dallas to Phoenix uh, a couple times a week, but uh, it's a great matchup. It's the matchup I think the league wants. I, I hope it shakes out that way because they obviously have their rivalry. They have their little brouhaha the other night, but oh, they yes. also have the built-in three of, of just the, the history of these two teams playing each other in the playoffs. This goes all the way back to Steve Nash, Dirk Nowitzki, Jace Kidd. Like, th- there's so many layers to this story, so uh, the league needs this bad. I want it bad. Yeah, this this would be incredible. Obviously, everything Eddie just said with Luca and, and Devin's uh, little beef there, but th- this would be a mismatch uh, nightmare, I think, for Dallas. They lack defensive presence. They lack toughness, defense, and and the Phoenix Suns can score the ball just as good as anybody now with KD. So if I had to give an advantage here, I, I think I'd go with Phoenix, but there's a lot of basketball to be played. There's a lot of Dallas got hot a couple years ago and made that big run. Uh, who knows? But for the fans, for the ratings, for the league, I, this would be, I would watch every single game and, and this would be the best series. Thousand percent. Every second. Oh yeah. Shams. Uh, this would be the one, the, right? The, I mean, I, look, there are a lot of them, but this one's good. Yeah. But I, I just, I kind of agree with Chandler. I feel like this Mavericks team, I, I, I love Luca. I love Kyrie. They're, they're, they're clearly uh, some, some depth issues still there. Right. When you think about the wings, the bigs, Phoenix is a little bit more further along when you think about a, t- a true title contending team. The pieces that they have, Chris Paul, uh, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, DeAndre Ayton, and then they, they're like those four guys are all eight, you know, B plus eight type starters. And then you have Josh Okogie who can really do a bunch of everything in your starting five. And you have some guys coming off the bench that play roles as well. Um, I, I don't know if Dallas's depth is quite there uh, as far along as Phoenix's. No, but playoffs are exciting because you never, ever know. Look, Utah started the season off pretty hot, and I think they shocked the world in doing so. But now they've lost their four straight, uh, a season low, just kind of crazy to say, four games under 500. Let me ask you guys this. Uh, a successful end to this season, Shams, for that team would look like what? I think we're seeing it develop right now before our eyes, right? When you think about they got off to a great start, and I think everything they've wanted out of the season, it's happened. They've been competitive. You've had players grow. Guys like Lowry Marketing emerge as star players. Uh, Will Hardy clearly looks like he's going to be a great coach in this league. But at the end of the day, I think going into the year, you always looked at the Jazz as being a team that's going to be competing for a lottery position. I, I I, I think they're prioritizing player development, and I'm not sure if winning at the highest of levels is exactly their goal right now. I don't think they have a, a real problem with staying competitive <laughs> while, you know, night in, night out, playing these close games. So th- they've gotten really everything they've wanted out of the year. They've developed these guys. Walker hmm. Kessler looks like he's going to be a player for the next 15 years in this league. So uh, I, I do think whether they make the play-in, whether they miss the play-in, I think this is going to be a su- successful year for the Jazz. 
Yeah, I agree with Shams. I mean, this is all about player development now at this point forward. And we, when they got off to that hot start, we kind of knew it was fool's gold, right? We knew it wasn't going to sustain. We knew this wasn't a contending team. But they played hard, and they got the crowd. They got that whole city involved early on. And they've truly made a star out of Laurie Market. And hopefully it's not a one and done, and this kid continues to grow. Jordan Clarkson's had a great year. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it, Walker Kessler, like Sean just said, he he's turned out to be an unbelievable draft pick. So I think that what's done is done here. They had a great season. They stayed competitive for a while. Now it's time to lose games and try and get the best possible pick because they're not, not going to make noise in the playoffs. They're not going to contend. And what's done, like I said, is done. They gave them their all. They played hard, continue to grow their players, stay healthy, look forward to free agency and next next. Oh, it's like a nice, just wrap it up. You had some fun and now we're moving on to the reality of the situation. I, I, I don't hate it. Um, oh man, this game last night, it, I, I was bummed. I was bummed. There was a streak on the line. The Knicks had gone in with a nine game win streak, but the Hornets with the win. Uh, Josh Hart afterward asked if fatigue played a factor in their loss. Here's his response. Our job is to play basketball and our job, is, and it's, you got people Getting up at 6 a.m. doing 12-hour shifts, those guys are tired. You know, for us, you know, we're playing a game, and obviously we're fortunate enough to play a game like this, but we have to um, keep that in perspective. I mean, we got to go out and compete and play a game that we love to do and to compete at the highest level. So, you know, we got to make sure we're full of energy and lively every time we step on the court. All right, look. I, we obviously love the answer, right, Eddie? I mean, it's a, it's a, the perfect answer. But just a reminder, in Sunday's double overtime win, uh, Quickly had 55 minutes, Barrett had 50, Randall had 46. The answer is great, but are you buying it? Is fatigue, was fatigue a factor last night? I'm sure it was. And, and I, I'm sure Tom Thibodeau loves that answer. But, yeah, these guys have played a lot of minutes. They're traveling. They're doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, Chandler knows the, the guys count on the schedule losses. Sometimes you just have issues and you just play too much basketball. I love the answer though. And I think it's a sign of things to come with players, just mostly biting back at the idea that they're the issue with, with load management. Now you're seeing a lot of players starting to speak up and say, yo, I want to play. I'm not being allowed to play. And I think it's gonna get louder and louder as we go on, but yeah, I love the answer. Tough loss for those guys, but you know, they're rolling so they can shake this one off and keep going. Yeah, this is this is one bad loss after two to three weeks of unreal basketball. So listen, I love I love the kid Josh Hart. His answer was so mature and actually real and brilliant. <laughs> Um, everyone's tired. Everyone, uh, all teams are tired right now. This is kind of that grinding part of the season where again, every game matters. Um, but this is also why I'm not really buying the Knicks. They come at, <gasps> they, they lose to at home to with no mellow ball to the Charlotte Hornets. Again, it's one loss after pretty much a very good month. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's, I love, I love what he's saying. I love, I love players that take accountability. He's not blaming anything on fatigue. He knows everybody across the league is tired right now. So that's why would that be an excuse for us in the New York Knicks? So, uh, I love what he said, but I'm just extremely distracted by the bunk bed behind Eddie's <laughs> <laughs> It's a loft bed, Chandler. It's a loft, a loft bed. bed. Is that, how is that different from a bunk? I'm going to have to look that up. I didn't know. Yeah, it's more things. mature. It's more mature. It's for adults. You get it now. Shout out to Airbnb for that. Shout <laughs> out indeed for giving us the distraction. Uh, we appreciate you. Look, Chandler, I'm a little bit shocked by your answer because so the loss to the Hornets is what's giving you doubt about the Knicks, but not the fact that they've had some great wins up until last night. Why, why, why this oh, loss yeah, to this Hornets? Again. This they've had a this is one blip on the radar and teams can't go perfect. Every good team this year, you look at the Bucks, you look at the Celtics, they lost to the Magic. Like every good team has a bad loss, but it's just this just kind of puts a stamp of approval to me on the Knicks that they're not there yet. They have lapses, they don't have they're not deep enough, and I just don't think they're a contender in a stacked Eastern Conference. And when I watch a game like last night and I see the Charlotte Hornets without their best player and these guys doing whatever they want against this team. Yes, they're tired. Yes, we're talking back-to-backs. Yes, we're talking high minutes for their players. But this is a pretty, at the end of the day, this is a bad loss to a horrific team that's trying to lose. Trying. Well, it didn't look like they were trying last night. I was taking a quick break here. When we come back, does Harden deserve more respect? Is Mikel Bridges a number one option? Huh, we'll find out when Run It Back returns. Run it up, run it back, run it up, 
run it back. Yeah, yeah, run it up. Uh, it's time for a little you buy in that. How about James Harden? I don't know what they want from me. You know what I mean? I've been doing this for a very long time. I've been one of the most consistent players in the league since I've been in. So so Rodney Dangerfield of him. I'm loving that for him. All right. You buy in that James Harden deserves more respect, Chandler. Uh, yes and no. Listen, I think what they want is a championship. They want to see this guy carry a team and, and now they, they want him to win a championship and he's yet to do that. Um, and I think just all the, the stuff in the past with his, his defensive highlights and him kind of getting out of the way and not playing hard at that end, I think kind of lowered the respect for him initially. But listen, we're talking about one of the greatest scorers of all time. We're talking about one of the greatest two guards of all time. And we're talking about a first ballot Hall of Famer with or without a championship. So I don't know how much more respect you possibly want, but uh he, he's having a great year now he seems to be finding a rhythm right now with Joel and B Philly uh, he's kind of distributing more kind of playing that point guard role with them uh so listen he has had a great career and I think now they just want to see a little more effort on the defensive end and I think a, a championship would be the the cherry on top for kind of his career and not a championship where he goes in three years and plays you know five minutes a game they want to see him be an impact player <laughs> like he is right now on the sixer <laughs> as a two or three or one option some nights and go and get a championship in Philly this year that we can't say anything bad about him if he does that Chandler said it perfectly and and, and James knows this too James knows exactly what people want from him it's a championship. He knows that he says that every now and then I need to win a championship. He went to Brooklyn because he wanted to win a championship Went to Philly because he wanted to win a championship. So great quote. It sounds cool. And, and he's getting plenty of respect, but he knows the last hurdle, the last kind of notch on his belt is a championship. And he's probably closer than he's been in, in since 2018, 17. So this is his time oh. to capitalize, but yeah, that's the answer. It's a championship that then he'll get way more respect. That seems simple enough. Uh, you know, he's easier said than done, uh, Eddie, but is he the best player currently that does not have a ring? I know that list has quite a few names on it right now, but he seems to be one of those. Where is he? Oh, I mean, it's an interesting list. Uh, you know, maybe it's Jokic. I mean, there, there's a lot of guys, uh, you know, as far as guys in their 30s, as far as guys who have mm -hmm. won MVPs, who have been all-stars, you know, he's up there, um, but he does not want to join that Charles Barkley list. I know that much. Yeah, has Chris Paul? Chris Paul hasn't won a championship, right? No. So I would I would put him probably above James Harden. I'd love to see this list because there are probably a lot of really good players uh that have not won a championship. But yeah, like Eddie said, there's a lot of younger guys that are kind of on the on the rise right now that also have yet to be a championship. But yeah, someone in their 30s in the latter half of their career that don't have a championship. Uh, you, you got to put him up there. I mean, there's a two time now about to be three time NBA MVP that has yeah. been to a championship. So uh, there's a lot of guys on this list and there's still time, but yeah, James is, James is up there and needs that to solidify his greatness. I mean, I know the timing of this was all very weird given the, the year that Philly's having, and that it seems to be they're gelling and they're doing things like they're supposed to be. But then we had that story that came out about James Harden, possibly returning to Houston. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess anything's possible, Chandler. W did you give any weight to that? What'd you think about that? Uh, no, it's weird to me because the situation in Philly right now is so good and they actually have a great team and he's got a co-star and, uh, and Joel and B. Well, he's actually the co-star, but he's got a great supporting cast. He seems to be getting along with Doc Rivers and the Rockets suck and have no future. <laughs> they have no, wow. nothing going on there. So it's, it's, I, I don't really get it. I know James loves Houston. He's got his restaurants there. He's got his house there. Like he loves it. And I love Houston. It's a great town, but as a career change at this point of your career, when it, people want to see you win a championship and you want to go to the, one of the worst teams in the NBA, uh, the math doesn't really add up <laughs> to me. It, it, he likes the city and the people there that much to, to just, go there and not compete for a championship for however much longer he plays. <laughs> yeah, Eddie, I mean, look, if he wins the ring in Philly, whatever the odds of that are, I guess it then would make go sense. Back. But, then go back yeah, to right? Houston. Yeah, but there's no chance. I mean, you don't, look, I don't know what's in his head, but it seems like an odd story to come out, period. Yeah, but I think there's, it's one of those things where there's so much smoke that I believe there's fire. I don't know that he's already made his decision. I don't know that you do, do the Rockets want him? Like, we don't know that they, they didn't exactly part on good terms, but it's <laughs> been mentioned so much. And it seems like such the James Harden thing. 
And maybe that's what he needs to do. Maybe he needs to win a title and then he just sail off into the sunset of, of barbecue and strip clubs in, in Houston. I, I, I don't know, but there's a lot of smoke. So uh, you, you, you think you it's the barbecue? The you think it's the barbecue in Houston? Probably the, the, probably the latter. <laughs> <of Houston. laughs> Someone I mean, call don't, don't, get <laughs> don't get me wrong. Uh, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll change stories real quick. Uh, Brooklyn Nets. Look, February 9th was the day. Mikael Bridges goes over there. Uh, he has now scored 30 or more points in three straight games, five times overall since going over there. Uh, his coach said about him, quote, he is very unselfish. He gives up his time, his knowledge in the locker room during the game. So it's really been a joy to be around and learn from him as an individual. Eduardo, are you buying Bridges as the number one? Uh, yeah. I mean, Nets fans are telling me they traded KD for young KD, which is stretch. <laughs> wow. But, uh, he's 27 years old, and I think he's always had this ability. It, it's so something people say all the time is, you know, the NBA, it's, it's about opportunity and there's a lot of talented guys in this league. And if they get enough opportunity, they can, they can perform. I think it's a really great example of that. He's built for the modern NBA. He got handled. He's tall. He can shoot. He can get to the cup and he plays defense. Like he, he has the ability to be an all-star if he has the opportunity to be an all-star. And I think he will in Brooklyn. So yes, they, it would behoove them to build around him, but they're also set up to get another star and maybe they go get another star who's a little bit better than Michael Bridges. And then he's the number two option, but he's a great number two. If that's where they go with it, he's been great. He's been exactly what they've wanted from, from that trade. And uh, their future's bright. I know it sucks to lose Kyrie KD and James Harden in about 12 months, but their future's bright either way. Yeah. To me, he's, he's Paul George with like a little less sauce on the offensive end, but still produces and gets those numbers. And you look at him in 10 games, he's averaging 27, six, five and three, shooting 53% from the field and 48% from the three. That's a number one option. Those are, those are great numbers. And he's a number one option because he literally is a number one option on this Brooklyn Nets team. Uh, and he's kind of exceeded expectations and they did trade one of the best players of all time to get this dude. And, and you can see the potential in Phoenix games where he was one of the last three and D guys, but now he's expanded his game. Now he's got a little bag to him. Now he's got an ISO. He gets out in transition. Like Eddie said, there's nothing on the floor that Mikhail Bridges can't do. And I know the kid a little bit. He's a great dude and he loves basketball and he loves he's a good kid. And he's not, he, he's someone that you want to be the face of your franchise. And are they going to contend if he's a number one seed or number one option? Probably not, but you pair two or three other really good players with him. Now all of a sudden they have a team and they have a championship caliber team, but uh, this kid has been nothing shy of great. And, and I hope it continues for him because he's one of the, like we just talked about, he's one of the last players that played just as hard on the defensive end as the offensive end and his numbers lack on that on the offensive end too. I mean, it's the best case scenario. The Nets hand was forced, right? Like those, those relationships were dead. They had to make these trades. I, I think it was the best case scenario, everything that they got in return moving forward. Um, in the Eastern conference, however, if they want to be contenders, there's one team, I, there are a few teams, but the bucks are, they're just ridiculous right now. Things are looking very good for them. They beat the magic by 11. They had no Giannis, no drew holiday, but the big part that you want to focus on here is that six Milwaukee players scored in double digits. What a great time to be alive. If you're a bucks fan Chandler, I mean, this is, this is about as good as it gets, right. As we're, as we're nearing the end of the regular season. Yeah, they're hitting their stride at the right point, and, and they're extremely deep. And again, this is a team that can do it all. They play offense, they play unselfish, they move the ball, but then also they're one of the best defensive teams, and they have good guard play, they have good wings. And if you look at the kind of the, the season here, they've been the best team in the NBA without their second best player being who we know he is in Chris Middleton. And he's going to continue to get better. He's going to get his legs we all know what Giannis is going to do, but yeah, games like this where you can plug in Javon Carter, Joe Ingles, Jay Crowder, Pat Connaughton, these guys getting these reps, it's only going to help them. It's only going to help their depth. It's only going to help their experience getting into the playoffs. And this team is super hard to beat right now. And it's scary, right? I mean, this, the Eastern conference. Oh, Eddie froze. This makes me so sad. What are we going to do? All right. Well, then I know. Well, Chandler, it's you and me then. I, I guess we can go to Kyle Kuzma, and I want to because I haven't been able to mention the words swaggy and P together in a <laughs> sentence in quite some time. And now I finally get to do that again. Kyle Kuzma went full swaggy P last night just with the heave, celebrating it before, <laughs> before it clanks off the... Sir. <laughs> sir. 
Why, okay, Chandler, why have guys not learned their lessons? This is not a good move. It never works. You would, you would think with social media and everything that this is not going to be a good look. <laughs> It wasn't even close either, Michelle. This thing no. was damn near an air ball. It was so short. I mean, listen, they got a little lead. They're playing a not so good team. He's having fun. He's feeling himself. Would it have been way cooler <laughs> if it went in? Yeah, but even the bench, the bench is in complete disarray. Uh, and at least they got a good laugh out of this. But if this was a critical part of the game, this was a huge shot and he did this, this would be exposed a little bit more. But <laughs> Porzingis is over there dying on. <laughs> I mean, it's the reaction is it's worth every second. It's, it's, it's not even close. Like, what does he see? Take us through it as a shooter. What does he see from his angle that made him think, yep, make yeah, it I rain. Mean, like, <laughs> at least Swaggy P's kind of like went around and popped yes. out. <laughs> Listen, he felt it. Maybe he had just hit a couple shots and uh, part of me, but what? I didn't watch <laughs> with the Pistons game last night. I don't know if he had, was on a heater right here and he had, you know, made a couple shots. But clearly, he thought this was cash. Uh, mm. He had an open look. He got separation right here. The guy bit on the shot fake, and this was this was no this is nowhere close. It's Tough beautiful. Breaker. It's a, it's it's a long came Polly Philip Seymour Hoffman, and every time he would hey, shoot man. garbage and make it rain. <laughs> it looks like Teardrops. except for your Kyle your Kyle Kuzma, bro. <laughs> you can't be doing that. Um, you know, I'm worried about Eddie, but maybe, maybe during the break, we can figure out what happened to him. Maybe we'll get him back. Maybe we won't. We need him back for the parlays. And I'm the one that should probably remove myself from the equation. Cause when we come back once again, I have failed you America, but we will once again, try to win you back some cash when run it back returns. Welcome back to Run It Back. Um, Eddie is back, uh, much to the joy of all of us. And I'd also like to point out, Eddie, that you've taken us on an emotional roller coaster today um, with everything that you've got going on, but you also educated us. Tell us again what is behind you. It's not, in fact, a bunk bed. I think it's, it's a, a <laughs> yeah, a loft bed, a sleigh bed. It's an Airbnb sleigh thing. Bed. It's like, you know, it's so the Airbnb can lie and say, the 10 people can fit here instead of seven, but, <gasps> ah, yes, but yes, yes, it's yes. cozy. It's cozy. It's cozy. Yes. I'm just happy to see your uh, smiling face back with us again because, well, first let's go over the bad news for me. <laughs> Last night's parlay, you guys killed it. Just two professionals doing their thing. Um, looking great. I'm going to probably remove myself from these in the next couple of weeks because I have not gotten one right in quite some time. Um, do you guys feel good about this? Like, can you give me some tips? What are we doing here? Uh, well, honestly, well, being terrible. Yeah, I, I you really, tell her doing something way different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to start you go with the, start going with the money line. Start going with the locks, Michelle. Okay, that's where I need to start again. Okay, fine. All right, so then I have another shot tonight. I already am doubting myself, but the good news is, even if I do lose, I don't have to see all faces for four days. But we'll start with uh, we'll start with Eddie, who's been on a tear. Talk to me. How do I win money? Go. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm out here to see Kevin. Kevin Durant's first home game with the Phoenix Suns. Mm. Ticket prices have quadrupled, apparently. Uh, I'm going to go with the over. I'm just going to assume he's going to score 39 points tonight. So 20, 26 is nothing. So go with the over, bet on the big fella, and uh, trust in that home crowd. I like the conservative angle that you're taking. Not 40, which everybody does on a nightly basis, but 39. Well done, sir. Um, and I also love that he said <laughs> he knows it's going to be loud. It's going to be loud. Um, Chandler? What do you have for us? I'm surprised it's 25 and a half. I feel like right? even if it was Stop. 29, 29 and a half, I'd still go over. <laughs> so I like that one a lot. Uh, here I go again with the with the Clippers. Listen, this team oh, has potential. This team is healthy, minus Norman Powell. They've lost a lot of teams recently. There's no reason that they shouldn't beat the Toronto Raptors by three points tonight. Give me the LA Clippers. I mean, that feels... Fine. I feel like that makes sense. I also feel like mine makes sense. Mavs are just minus one and a half at Pelicans. Pelicans have not been doing much to uh, to be super stoked about. So that feels like a low point total, which means Pelicans will win. 
by 30 uh, and you're welcome. So yeah, put 20 bucks on that. I don't know if you can retire necessarily, but you can certainly buy yourself a, a meal or something. Uh, <laughs> good God, guys. I like, I like yours the most, Michelle. I really you do. do. Then why didn't you no, take it? You no liar. Rockets bet. So I think we might win. Thank you. <laughs> no Rockets bet. I like that. I like it so all. much. I didn't pick it, Michelle. Exactly. I hate you. Okay. That'll do it for us on this lovely Wednesday. We're going to go out, recoup, figure out our things, come back on Monday, 10 Eastern. See y'all then. Run it back, run it back, run it back, run it back, run it back.